Welcome to Rams Up, a Los Angeles Rams podcast. We are a proud member of the Pigskin Podcast Network. We cover other SoCal sports news of interest, but we're mostly about your Los Angeles Rams. I'm your host, Mark. Let's get to it. Welcome back, Ram fans. Season 2, Episode 28 of LA Rams Up, your Los Angeles Rams podcast. What do we have for you this episode? We're going to have our training camp update, obviously, as the Rams move into their second week of practices at, at UC Irvine. And we're also going to have a little bit of fun, our first hack at the playoff predictions for this year, otherwise known as Who Do the Rams Beat in the Super Bowl? And, you know, we like to keep a tab on our NFC rivals and the top teams in the AFC. We do that on a weekly basis, but I think it's wise to check in on our biggest rivals, our biggest NFC rivals and our divisional rivals. And this week, I'm going to have a little segment, Getting Caught Up with the Seattle Seahawks. Before we get to our training camp segment, get get through some other stuff real quickly. We dropped a nice little video on our YouTube channel celebrating the greatest Ram duos of all time. Check that out if you have some time and subscribe, please. One thing I got to mention right off the top, sources saying late Sunday, the 49ers and Debo Samuel are in agreement on a big contract extension, keeping him in San Francisco. Three-year extension worth $73.5 million with $58.1 million guaranteed. So, We'll talk about that next week. This is just coming in. Maybe we'll check in on the 49ers next week. We mentioned that four hours of film study clause added to Kyler Murray's contract last year. Boy, that was a bad look for Murray and the Cardinals. Torrey Holt called them out so badly. Actually calling out Kyler Murray. The fact that an NFL quarterback has to be basically bribed. Is that the right word? To study. Tory went off on him on this Twitter space. It was pretty funny. Tory Holt not feeling the Kyler Murray love. But then the cards rescinded it after all. But damage done in my opinion. The fact that the Cardinals felt like they needed to put that in there. Boy, that's a bad look for a guy that just got paid to be the leader of an NFL franchise. Now we're going to talk about the Seahawks at length a little bit later on, but should mention up front here, DK Metcalf gets his extension, three years, $72 million. Makes him the highest paid Seahawk player, and he's tied with Stephon Diggs as the sixth highest paid NFL receiver. And another Seahawk note, Chris Carson, their super productive seventh round draft pick running back, has retired due to his concerns about a neck injury. Can't blame him. Maybe makes more sense now why the Seahawks drafted Kenneth Walker III. He'll be paired up with Rashad Penny. Seahawks running game, at least the running backs, will be in pretty good shape. And good news and bad news coming out of Tampa Bay. They sign Julio Jones, the great wide receiver. I'm not sure how much that adds to this Tampa Bay attack, but can't hurt. But then Ryan Jensen, their incredibly gifted center, out until at least November, possibly December, possibly the entire year with a knee injury. So Tom Brady can't be happy about that. That really puts a ding in the Bucks' offensive line and looks like he'll definitely miss that matchup with the Rams in October. I also talked about the Hall of Fame senior finalists and the coach contributor finalists. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but I did not do very good on my predictions, although two Rams... Maxie Bond and Eddie Meter make it to the next round. And the coach that I think is most deserving, can't believe he's not already in the Hall of Fame, Don Coriel, he moves on to the next round as well. So Bond, Meter, and Coriel, the three guys I really cared about. Billy White Shoes Johnson did not make it, though. That's another one I'm a little disappointed about. I'm going to touch real briefly on the Dodgers. Could be a trade forthcoming. Could have happened already by the time you hear this. I'm just hoping it's not Gavin Lux. But then I looked at the lineup this morning. Mookie Betts is at second base. I'm thinking, well, if Betts is playing second base, then their 
sitting down Lux because he's part of a trade and they can't roll him out there. But no, Lux is in left field and rookie James Altman is making his debut in right field. And what a debut he had. He went off. One of the best major league debuts you'll ever see, including a home run in his first at bat. So I don't know what's going on here. Maybe you'll know by the time you hear this. They're not protecting Lux. Maybe they're showcasing Outman. I don't know. I don't get it. Must be some data analytics going on here. I mean, come on. Max Muncy was still on the lineup. Maybe there's no trade at all. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they had to replace Zach McKinstry with a position player, and that position player was, was James Outman. And Outman's out there performing at least for one day. So we'll see. I just hope they don't trade Lux. I don't think that really improves the team that much, throwing Soto in the outfield. Unless Mookie Betts is your new second baseman, go figure. We'll be back in a second with our Rams training camp update. Football fans, DraftKings changed the fantasy game forever in 2012. Now, 10 years later, they're doing it again with Rainmakers Football, their first ever NFT fantasy game. A new way to enjoy fantasy football on a daily basis and a new shot to win millions in prizes. Playing Rainmakers Football is simple. Buy, sell, bid, and win player cards are the biggest names in the game through regular drops and auctions. Build your collection of football stars and enter free Rainmaker Football contests all season long to compete for millions in jaw-dropping prizes. Each week, craft your lineup of athletes from your NFT collection and rack up points. The next generation of fantasy football sports is almost here. Download the DraftKings Daily Fantasy app now and sign up with promo code TPPN. Click the Rainmakers tile and opt in so you can be ready for the next drop. Play free for millions in prizes all football season and build the ultimate NFT fantasy franchise with Rainmakers Football. That's promo code TPPN only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Okay, let's get to the important stuff. Rams training camp update. The biggest news, kind of the bummer news, Van Jefferson having issues with his knee, the one he had surgery on. He's seeing a specialist, may have already seen that specialist by the time you hear this. Hoping, crossing our fingers, it's just a minor setback and no further surgery is needed. But kind of a bummer. Fortunately, the Rams are deep at that position. They got a great wide receiver room. OBJ still hanging out there, but Hope and Van Jefferson is back on the field soon. We'll have to wait and see. And the other news, no real surprise, but it's obvious Bobby Wagner will be wearing the green dot. I raised some concerns about that. I raised concerns about his vulnerability in the passing game, but maybe I'm blowing that up a little bit more than I should. Rams don't seem to be too concerned if he's going to be calling the plays for the defense. They'll be out there for every down. And then Jacob Harris news. The tight end experiment is over and he's back to playing wide receiver exclusively. Now, when I first heard Harris was on the outs as a tight end, I was kind of selling his stock. Didn't think that was a good sign for his chances of making this roster at all. But then I heard the Van Jefferson news. And I thought, maybe that has something to do with it. So I don't know what to make of it. But Harris is going to have to make this team as a wide receiver and a special teams player. So we'll have to watch that very closely. Probably the biggest standout of training camp so far would would be the six-round cornerback, Darion Kendrick, out of Georgia. This is the guy that got recruited as one of the top wide receivers in the country. Clemson switched him to cornerback where he played in a college football championship game. Clemson won that game. Then he goes to Georgia after getting into some trouble at Clemson and wins another football championship. 
gets drafted in the sixth round, I think partly due to his character concerns that he left behind him at Clemson and the fact that he may not be ideal in man-to-man coverage, but Rams love him what they see so far, and they're also loving what they're seeing out of Dakobe Durant. Kobe, Dakobe, seen it both ways. Drafted higher than Kendrick and expected to contribute pretty soon, and he has been doing really well, making some splash plays alongside Kendrick. So the Rams may have hit on both of those guys. And McVay, also talking up Russ Yeast, the seventh round draft pick, the safety out of Kansas. He's taking advantage of the fact that Quentin Lake, the other safety drafted, has not been able to practice. McVay and Raheem Morris very happy with how Russ Yeast has looked on the field. And Bryson Hopkins, reports are he looks very svelte, a little bit faster, a little bit leaner, which could increase his productivity in the passing game. Him and Kendall Blanton apparently battling for that number two spot. I see Hopkins as the better blocker, Blanton as the better receiver, but Hopkins looked pretty darn good in the receiving game in the playoffs last year. So really optimistic about both of these guys, to be honest with you. And the Rams are just thrilled with Allen Robinson, his ability to get in sync with Matthew Stafford and the really quickly running all the routes, productive in the red zone. They are just ecstatic about what they have in Allen Robinson. And that makes me very happy. I think this Robinson Cup duo, you know, I talked about that great Ram duos on our YouTube channel. Hey, maybe these two are the next Great Ram duo, Cooper Cup and Allen Robinson. Leonard Floyd taking a moment to tell everyone how impressed he has been with Terrell Lewis and how well he is taking care of that knee, which has kind of held him back a little bit, right? Well, he looks 100% in camp now, apparently, according to Leonard Floyd. And don't fret about our edge rushers just quite yet, folks. We were fine before we had Von Miller. We were better when we had him but we're going to be just fine without him. And I'm wondering, with Treven Howard unable to practice, is this opening the door for the undrafted rookie Jake Hummel to make this roster? Haven't heard any noise yet, but the Rams are really thin after Jones and Wagner. So maybe Jake Hummel has a chance to make this team. I'll be keeping an eye on him in preseason games as well. And lastly, but not leastly, Tutu Atwell, McVay, really happy with the work he's done in the offseason. I still think Atwell has a chance to be a dynamic player. I know a lot of you have given up on him. I have not. And with Van Jefferson slowed by this injury, maybe this is an opportunity for Tutu. He just needs to stay on the field and prove that he can survive the hits that are surely coming. And did you see McVay in his press conference talking about OBJ Saying, hey, I, I know you're hit, I know you're listening, OBJ. We want you back. I'm paraphrasing here, and OBJ tweeted at him, that's my dog. So I I got a really good vibe. Really hopeful that OBJ is coming back. Just a matter of time. Probably the biggest battle in camp right now, Coleman Shelton versus Logan Bruss for that right guard position. They're not handing it to Bruss, that's for sure. They're gonna both get their shots in the preseason. Hey, it's a good problem to have. The Rams clearly feel either one of these guys is up to the task. And we got two of them. May the best man win. I'm betting on Bruss. I had mentioned uh, a couple weeks back, may have been even last week, I didn't see Xavier Jones as having a realistic chance to make this team. And sure enough, he was waived. The Rams signed Trey Ragus, a power back, 5'10", 214 out of Louisiana. He was with the Raiders last year in the preseason, got in one game, had one carry for nine yards. In the preseason, he had a big game against the 49ers. I've always felt it's advantageous in the preseason to have a back like this, a big power guy, that you can go out there and give him 20, 30 carries in a meaningless preseason game. And you know what? It's an opportunity for this guy, if he gets those chances, to show that, hey, you know what? I'm an NFL running back. And the Rams may have room for someone. We'll have to see. But Trey Ragus, expect to see him getting a lot of carries in the preseason. That's my guess. A 
couple of last notes, not so much practice field stuff, but Ram stuff in general. Rams have three players in the top six when it comes to licensed product sales. Cup number three, Aaron Donald number five, Matthew Stafford number six. It's really surprising, in all seriousness, a, a fan base that is relatively small, but leading the way when it comes to these licensed product sales with these three guys especially. Maybe this fan base is on the uptick. Maybe we're witnessing a growth of this fan base. That would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? So much good stuff going on with this franchise. And the Rams released their uniform schedule. You can view that schedule on the Rams website, obviously. Eight games with the white jerseys. Seven games with the blue jerseys. Only two with the bone uniforms. And I know a lot of people really hating on them. I kind of like them. My special assistant wants them to just go away. But I'm kind of a fan, though. But I like them all. Love those helmets. Best uniforms in the league, without a doubt. So we'll be back in a second with our playoff predictions, and then we'll check in on the Seattle Seahawks. too early for this, but I am going to offer up my predictions for the NFL season. Who's going to win each division? Who's going to sneak into the playoffs via wild card? And how those playoffs shake out. Now, later on in the summer, when we get closer to opening day, I'll have two of my regular guests, Paul Wallia and Tom Quartz, back on, and we will share our thoughts on this. So this is not my last hack, just my first shot at this. Get the mainframes going, crunch data 24-7 for a couple of days, and, and then actually what I did was I headed to my spreadsheet and I went through each game, all 272 games, picked the winner for each game, and this is how it all turned out. Our Rams finished 12-5, and five, taking the NFC West. The Eagles, Vikings, and Buccaneers win their divisions. Yes, the Vikings, 12-5. and five. And who are my wild cards? the Cowboys, the Packers, and, get this, the Lions. And I'll explain that in a second. In the AFC, the Chargers take the NFC West 13-4. The Bengals, Colts, and Bills win their divisions. The Bills with the best record in football at 14-3. The Wild Cards, two more teams from the AFC West, the Chiefs and the Raiders. And the final Wild Card, the Tennessee Titans. Now, you're probably wondering, what the heck, how do I have the Lions in the playoffs and who missed the playoffs? One team of note, the Denver Broncos. And another thing that came out of this was the Seattle Seahawks finished 8-9. and nine. Now, if you listen to my checking in on the Seattle Seahawks segment, you probably won't find that too surprising. So let me explain some of these before I move on to the playoff picture. How did the Lions come away with 10 wins? Well, a lot of people just look at a team, make an assessment of how strong they are, and go, hey, you know what? They're an eight-win team. They're a nine-win team. They're a seven-win team. That's a faulty approach. You gotta look at the schedule. It's kind of obvious. And I have the Lions getting wins against the Eagles on opening day. That would clearly be an upset. And then wins against the Commanders, the Dolphins, the Bears. The Giants, the Jags, I have them beating the Vikings once, and then the Jets and Panthers, and then the Bears a second time. So I don't think that's too outlandish that the Lions could win all those games. Now, I'm I'm not going out there and betting on the Lions, but I don't think it's that far-fetched for them to get to 10 wins. In actuality, they probably won't, but that's what I'm rolling with for now. I'll update this later on. And how did the Broncos miss the playoffs? I had them finishing 9-8. and eight. And you're asking, how did this team that added Russell Wilson and has a great defense, how did they lose eight games? Again, let's check in on their schedule. I have them losing to the Raiders, Chargers, Titans, the Raiders again, the Panthers, the Ravens, the Chiefs, the Rams, and then the Chiefs a second time. All of that 
seems entirely plausible to me. And that's what I went with. And, and by the way, when I've made these picks for each of these games, I made no consideration of what the record was week to week. I just went down line by line, 272 games, took a stab at who's going to win. Is that a foolproof method? Absolutely not. But that's what I got. Now, so I also wanted to talk about Seattle. How did Seattle get to eight wins? I have them winning at home against the Falcons, the Cardinals, the Giants, the Panthers, the 49ers, and the Jets. And to me, as tough as Seattle is at home against everyone except the Rams, makes a lot of sense to me. And I also have them with road wins against the Lions and Saints. Can Seattle get the eight wins? Absolutely. And like I said, in that earlier segment, that five and a half over under win total for the Seahawks is awfully tempting on the over. I think the Rams came in about where I would have expected if I took a guess before I did the line by line game picks. I saw someone on Twitter predicting the Rams would go 14 and three. Folks, that's not going to happen. Look at the schedule. It's just brutal. The Packers, the Vikings, the 49ers twice, the Cardinals twice, the Chiefs, the Broncos, the Chargers, and the Raiders, and the Bills. And maybe I should include the Cowboys. So Rams getting to 14 and 3, highly unlikely. I got them at 12 and 5. Again, we'll revisit this later on, maybe do it every few weeks, update my game by game picks and see what I come up with. In the playoffs. First round in the NFC, two NFC North teams face off and the Vikings end the Lions' dream. And the Packers go on the road and beat the Eagles. Cowboys and Buccaneers in Tampa Bay and Tom's still too good in the playoffs. Still better than Dak Prescott in crunch time and the Buccaneers and Tom Brady advance. In the AFC, the second seed Chargers take care of the Titans. In the AFC, the second seed at Chargers take care of the Titans. And how about this matchup? Kansas City travels to Cincinnati and they get their revenge. Chiefs pull out the win to advance and knock off the third seed at Bengals. And the Raiders also go on the road and take care of the Colts. Next round, Packers travel to Los Angeles. The Rams finally get the Packers in the Dome in January. And take care of business, take care of Aaron Rodgers and the Packers to advance to the NFC Championship. And the Vikings at home against the Buccaneers, and they get it done, potentially ending Tom Brady's career once and for all. The Vikings advance. And the Bills are just too good, too balanced, too deep. They take care of the Chiefs at home and the Chargers. How about this game? The Raiders and the Chargers at SoFi. Home game for the Chargers? Well, sort of, kind of. That would be a crazy atmosphere. But the Chargers find a way to win. They've learned the lesson from the Rams. Be prepared to deal with the crowd noise when you have the ball. If you're prepared for it, it's not that big a deal. Chargers are the better team, and they advance. But they have to travel to Buffalo, of all places, and they can't get it done in the AFC Championship game. The Bills advance. And the Vikings travel to Los Angeles, to L.A. teams in those championship games, and the Rams take care of the Vikings quite easily, actually. And the Super Bowl, Rams and Bills in Arizona. Last year, that's what I predicted. I was half right. This year, I'm rolling with that again. Not too exciting, probably. Kind of going chalk when it gets to the Super Bowl. A lot of people predicting this matchup. Rams and Bills in Arizona in the Super Bowl. And what do you know it? The Rams pull it off for their second straight Super Bowl win. Now, this is not my final answer. I'll be coming back to this on occasion. And like I say, I'll have my regular guest back on to do a roundtable discussion on this. Compare some notes. That'll be a lot of fun. But that's it for now. Rams over the Bills in Arizona in Super Bowl 57. (music) 
know, we stay so focused on our Los Angeles Rams, sometimes we lose track of our rivals in the NFC West. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to check in on the Seattle Seahawks. What's going on with the Seahawks? Actually, quite a bit. This team is in transition in more ways than one, and I'm going to get you caught up on what's going on with Seattle. First thing we should know is they are switching to a 3-4 defense. Longtime defensive coordinator Ken Norton is out, and Clint Hurt, promoted from defensive line coach, takes over, and he's switching them over to the 3-4. Be interesting to see how that impacts the production of Jamal Adams, their great strong safety, whose numbers have slipped especially in the sack department, and Jordan Brooks, their middle linebacker, taking over leadership of that defense from Bobby Wagner. And you know what? Why not switch to a 3-4? This defense has been pretty bad, especially in pass defense for the last couple of years. So Ken Norton leaves Seattle. He's back coaching linebackers at his alma mater, UCLA. Hey, maybe Ken and Bobby will be having lunch together in Los Angeles. Another thing going on there is the shuffle at the running back position. We were all a little confused when the Seahawks spent a second round draft pick on Kenneth Walker III. I mean, he's a great running back, number two in the draft by most accounts. But they already had Rashad Penny, who, who really went off late in the year, the final five games of the season. Penny rushed for 671 yards and six touchdowns, averaging 7.3 yards per carry. Those are some scary numbers if you're trying to defend the Seahawks. And they also had Chris Carson, the seventh round pick, who's had a couple of very good seasons. But it turns out Carson is retiring. Seventh round pick who played way beyond his draft position, had two really good seasons with Seattle. But he's retiring due to some concerns about his neck, some injuries he's had. So now it makes more sense, but between Rashad Penny and Kenneth Walker III, the Seahawk running game could be in pretty good shape. And helping that is the fact that they've finally addressed the offensive line, spending their first pick on Charles Cross. He'll move right in at left tackle, and by all accounts, he's going to be a good one. They also drafted Abraham Lucas in the third round. He's got a shot at starting at guard. The rest of the line... Nothing to sing about, but at least they're trying to address it, and I think Charles Cross is a big step in the right direction. The quarterback situation, Drew Locke and Geno Smith, that's who they have right now. Most of us thought they would make a move in the draft or free agency. Would they make a play on Jimmy G? I don't see the Niners going that way. Unless the Niners release him, maybe Seattle's betting on that. I think Jimmy G would be better than Locker Smith, but who knows what Pete Carroll's thinking. That's probably the biggest question in Seattle right now is how much production they're going to get out of those two quarterbacks and who's going to win the starting job. Another issue, who's going to provide the pass rush? They were 24th in the league last year in getting to the quarterback. Daryl Taylor comes back. He had He's the one that had that scary injury on Monday Night Football against the Saints. Finished with six and a half sacks. They picked up Uchenna Nuozu from the Chargers. Hopefully I pronounced that right. He had five sacks for the Los Angeles Chargers last year. And they also drafted Boya Mofe, another name I hope I got right, out of the University of Minnesota. Jamal Adams really contributed on that front in 2020. Did not have a single sack last year, though. So they got to figure that out. I mean, if they're going up against teams like the Rams and they can't put pressure on Matthew Stafford, it's over. I'm sorry. Seahawks have no chance. I mean, people that think the Rams need help on the edge, look at the Seahawks for a team that really does. The receivers are set. DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett but you talk about two polar opposites when it comes to on-field leadership traits. Tyler Lockett, he's a 10. DK Metcalf, not so much. Lockett turns 30 in September, but his production has not fallen off. Set a career high with 1,175 receiving yards last season, his third straight 1,000-yard season. But sometimes this is the age where productivity starts to 
turn down a notch. See how better hope Lockett still has it. Noah Fant comes over at tight end in that trade with the Broncos. Gerald Everett now with the Chargers. And Dwayne Eskridge didn't do much last year. He was a guy a lot of Ram fans liked. We're hoping the Rams would draft him. But Seattle grabbed him. The Rams got Atwell. So we'll see if Eskridge contributes this coming season. That'd be significant for the Seahawks if Eskridge came through for them. I already talked about Jordan Brooks a little bit. He set a single-season team record last year with 183 tackles. He's a guy that I liked coming out of college. He could be a pro bowler now that he's out of Bobby Wagner's shadow. Another guy that's underrated on that defense, Puna Ford, defensive tackle. He's a great player. That secondary, a lot in flex there. They were second last in pass defense last year, and they lose corner DJ Reed. They draft another guy Ram fans liked, cornerback Kobe Bryant. He will probably get plugged in as a starter. They also have last year's draft pick Trey Brown, and they picked up Artie Burns as a free agent. Now, a lot of folks are dismissing the Seahawks, and I'd go along with the idea that they are not a playoff team, but they're over and under set at five and a half right now. Um, I'm on that bet on the over with the Seahawks. I have them winning eight games. We have to consider their schedule. They have home games against the Falcons, Giants, Panthers, and Jets, as well as two divisional rivals that I think they could pull off wins against the Cardinals and Niners. They also have road games against teams like the Lions, and I think they'll have a chance to beat the Saints, depending on how the Saints season goes. So there is definitely at least six wins there. I would go with eight. I don't think I'd go much over that. I don't think they're a playoff team, but I think Pete Carroll and this roster is going to find a way to win some games this year. So I'm definitely taking the over on the Seahawks as far as the win total. A team in transition, a lot of changes, a lot of questions, but there's still some talent there. If things line up right, it's not going to be nearly as bad as a lot of people are predicting. Now, as far as the Seahawks and the Rams, those two games, I see the Rams taking both of them. I'm not going to say easily, but it's always tough in Seattle. Rams played them tough when they had Russell Wilson. I think they'll continue to play them tough. And Rams come away with two wins in their head-to-head matchups. So that hopefully gets you caught up with the Seattle Seahawks. That's going to do it for this episode. Remember, you can reach us at ramsuppodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website at ramsup.com. You'll find links to all of our episodes and a link to our YouTube channel. And you can also leave us a voicemail from our website. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. It's really appreciated. And remember, keep the horns up, stay safe, and have fun out there. Music courtesy of bensound.com and the YouTube royalty-free music audio library, Crimson Fly by Hama Hama.